you all for coming today. I know it's a Friday afternoon and you'd probably rather be spending your time doing something else, but hopefully we can make good use of this time. Like I mentioned, for those that you have just entered, thank you. Grab something to write with or open up a Word doc because uh, we're going to do some planning while we talk about planning and time management. And so um, as we get started, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So um, we're trying to talk today about how to work smarter. And um, a lot of these principles will, um, you can, I'll share ways that you can learn more about them later and, and hopefully kind of um, whet your appetite and get you started with the process. And so because today's conversation is going to be interactive, I'm gonna ask that if you can share in your chat or if you're on your phone and the chat isn't as accessible, if you'll unmute and share out loud, because we're gonna have some shared spaces. I wanted to kind of talk about a participant's pack. So let's um, be professional as we're, we're talking today, use appropriate language in the interactive parts. Let's have some respect for each other as we come from different identities and backgrounds. We all welcome each other's voices here. And please be present. Um, I'm already so amazed that you called in on a Friday afternoon. So let's use this time together. You are all brilliant in your own, in your own ways. And I'm really glad to be sharing this space. So use this as a hive mind to share with each other as well. And um, this is a, a Texas blue bonnet. Here's the, the picture I selected. I hail from Texas. And so I really um, miss seeing some of the blue bonnets like wildly growing. So sharing that a little bit with you today. All right. So as we get started, I wanted to, you know, ask you a little bit about why you're here. And um, so we're going to talk about this idea of avoiding good goals and having, a, um, having really, you know, you have really good goals, but it's a bad strategy. So we're gonna avoid that today. That's gonna be the, the crux of today's conversation. But before we do that, I'm just curious, um, what in particular do you wanna get out of today's conversation? You can share that in the chat or you can unmute, or I have this thing called the whiteboard. Have y'all used the whiteboard before? So to use the whiteboard, you go to your view bar and then there's a dot, 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 and you click on that and it allows you to annotate it. Okay. What do you want to get out of today's conversation? Oh, Neha found it. Thank you, Neha. You can use the text or the draw. Again, you could throw things into the chat as well. Different ways to participate today, or you can unmute. It's all welcome. Anyone looking for a, oh, we got here. It's like a, I'm at the edge of my seat. I don't know what Ron's gonna say. <laughs> How to, have y'all used the whiteboard for, board before? If it's new, don't worry, take your time to, to, to find it. We have, I have not. Um... Okay. And we've not had a com uh, presentation with whiteboard yet. The whiteboard before. I was having problems, so I'll just use the audio. Uh, mm -hmm. How to um, multitask more effectively or balance uh, response tasks and responsibilities. Yeah. So you said how to multitask and balance responsibilities. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you for unmuting and sharing that. Um, I have limited time in the lab, so being most productive with the amount of time I have while I'm physically in the lab. Yes, absolutely, Olivia. Aside from cloning yourself. Um, Neha wrote, um, learn time management skills to improve work-life balance, definitely. And then um, Lamise, I believe, if, forgive me um, for the pronunciation, achieve everyday goals on time as planned. That is, that's like the... That would be amazing. You could get all the gold stars. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for sharing. And as, as you, um, you know, have other um, goals that you want to share, go ahead and throw them in the chat. I'm going to take the whiteboard down for now. 
But um, let's go back to this idea. Like, you, you know, you all have things that you want to do. You're all moving things forward. And if you think about each X, right, and this is taken from football, also being a, a Texas person, not that all Texas people are, but this one is huge football fan. Um, this, you can imagine that an X might be like, okay, these are the, this is all the funding mechanisms that you're working on and you have to get the next grant. These are all the papers that you're writing and you're thinking about publishing. And these are the experiments that you're doing. So you're wanting to move everything forward and you have all really good goals, but as you may find, it's difficult to do all of these things in the allotted 24 hours a day, or hopefully you're sleeping and not, you know, working all hours of the day. But how do you move all those forward in a way that is strategic and that is focused and doesn't completely exhaust you? Because if you have a lot of good goals and no strategy, that's bad, right? So your long-term plan and the way that you're going to fix this or or, or adjust your way of looking at it is looking at your long-term plan. Because if you know what you're aligning your actions to, that's what strategy basically is. So you know what your long-term goal is and you're going to align your short-term goals to, um, to that. So you're looking at how to get there more easily. And, and so let's, let's talk about that first. And so when you define your strategy, I have this big view because you're looking at the forest for the trees. So in looking and defining your strategy, which we're going to do here today, you're going to talk about what your vision is, what your value proposition is, and what, who are your stakeholders? For whom are you doing this? So you're going to focus on the goal. You're going to look at the top of the mountain. You're looking at the forest for the trees. The second part of this session, we're going to talk about the actual trees and how to do the decision making on how to move forward. But for right now, we're going to define it. And so a lot of people forget to do that. And that's what the hustle and bustle of the day feels like. And I know what that feels like, right? Like being a postdoc, being a parent or running um, a whole research program and, you know, taking care of people in your family. Um, it, how do you do all of that and move forward and, and feel like you're progressing? All right, so the first thing we're gonna do to define your strategy, again, we're gonna talk about your vision and your value proposition and your stakeholders, and then we're gonna tie it together after that. Get out um, a piece of paper or start on your Word doc, and we're gonna talk about your vision statement, which is for you, right? Looking internally, taking a deep breath, what is the purpose of your work, of your research? and how you execute that work, right? So why is this work important to you? And what is unique about your research? Just think about that for a minute. Is the purpose of your work to um, try to look at disease mechanisms? Are you trying to find therapeutics? Are you building technology platforms to enable the research that you're doing and the research of others? Are you looking at, as they say, like trying to build a better mousetrap? Are you trying to look at the intersection of something? What is your vision for your work? Why is it important to you? Okay. Do you have a general reminder of why you get up in the morning and leave this crazy researcher life that you lead? We're going to move on. Okay. This is the vision statement that you usually present to others, right? You communicate this in your grants, in letters of intent, in letters to editors, <laughs> like response to editors. Those are crafted a little bit more delicately. Um, when you're recruiting employees, students, um, postdocs, and maybe when you're pitching or um, to, you know, giving short introductions of yourself in, in settings like at conferences or um, whenever you, you know, are meeting somebody and you run into them at lunch. I'm like, what is that? That was like a year ago <laughs> since I did that. Um, but this is important because you're familiar with this the of stating your vision to other people but reminding yourself of why you're doing the work today is going to be really important so the next thing we're going to talk about is um your stakeholder or your value proposition and your stakeholders and so what is unique about your work also depends 
on who you're speaking to, right? So this is your idea of your stakeholders. It's not shareholders. Some people think of it as a financial term. It's nothing to do with money per se. It's who has a stake in the success of your work. And so this could include a lot of different kinds of people in academia, right? It could be external to your organization, right? So it's the funders, people who are in communications or the media or publishing. And then internally, it's the employer yourself. It's maybe your um, PI, if you're a student or a postdoc, maybe it's your um, chair, right? Uh, your department head, whoever is in, um, is in that department or in your institute, or maybe it's people that's working with you, your students and your postdocs. And then um, you're looking at your research peers, which kind of are the bridge between the internal and external. You rely on them for feedback on your presentations and on your grants, but also the ones that are external, you might be collaborating with, right? So it's important to think about who you're speaking to because what's unique about your work and the way that you talk about it change and this is also going to be really important as you think about your strategy right so as you're thinking about who has a stake in the outcomes of your work you think about what is important to them and so for funders it's going to be important that you get you do the work that you're going to do right you re report that that you stay in budget right for example and and so that's one way that you're going to do that so just take a minute and write down some of the stakeholders that are top of mind for you. And maybe that's the public too. Maybe you're working on um, a grant that really involves some um, recruitment of, of public participants as well, clinical trials and things like that. So just take a minute and write down your stakeholders. I have an example here. So this is one way it could look, right? Um, this is based on research I used to do, right? So why is your work important? I develop therapies for Parkinson's disease. What's unique about it? My particular expertise is neuroinflammation and I investigate compounds in primary cells and mouse models because it's important to write all the ways that are unique about your work and then who has a stick in the outcome, right? Then that would be fellow grad students, postdocs, PI, funders, public, okay. Michael J. Fox Foundation. This is one example of how to write it down. So I'm gonna give you an, another few minutes. How are we doing? Anybody done yet? You can give me that little like reaction that's like the starburst or the confetti. But if you need more time, give me a thumbs up. Okay, it's gotta be one of the other folks. I got a confetti from Andy and uh, a confetti from Jasmine or Yasmin. Melissa's done. Nehas then. It's really important to think about this and we're gonna go over it a little bit more. But as you make decisions, say, I'm gonna put my like graduate student hat on and you've, you, know, you see your data and you have experiments that might move you in other directions. It's important to say, 
right? Like, do I want to continue on this line? Or if it brings you in another direction, do I want to chase that rainbow? And a lot of times too, as you go come back from a meeting with your PI, your PI might say, oh, that is really interesting. You know, if we're looking at this or we were looking at this, you would want to do this and this and this and this and this. And you're like, okay, that's really great. And remember to ground yourself in what your, your strengths are and what you want to do. Again, your vision to help you to define what's forward. And if really you've decided that you're going to veer from this path that you've set for yourself or your vision, obviously that's okay. That's science, that's research, that's what makes it exciting. But then you need to rewrite your vision and, and your value proposition and, and your you know, stakeholders so that the next move that you're doing, you're not veering either back or right, like that you're keeping on a path. And so that's one of the things, not to say that it's, it's rigid, but it helps you to remember that you have a good strategy, not good goals. Because you can be productive, but you can be productive and it not like move you forward in any way. All right, how are we doing? Any more people finish up? You wanna celebrate with some confetti? Okay. All right, we're gonna move forward to the next part. All right, here we go. So now let's get to the strategic planning part. Now you've thought about what it is that you wanna complete and the reason why you're doing it and the people that it's gonna be, you know, have a stake in it, that it's that are gonna care about your success. And now we're gonna get to the planning part because you're gonna be making those decisions and making your decision to come here again. Thank you <laughs> for, for the person who had unmuted and said that you're here for this. So now we have this vision of the trees because now this is kind of what you're looking at. Imagine every tree is a task that you have to do you know, by next week. And there's a lot of them. So how do you prioritize? What is the process for strategic, strategic planning? We're gonna talk about it. How do you prioritize? And then how do you apply time management principles to help you with that decision-making? Right. So now we're going to go through the trees and then we're going to zoom back out in a little bit. All right. So the, the strategic planning process typically involves three steps. It's brainstorming, then you prioritize, and then after you prioritize, you get specific. Right. A couple of other ways you can think about this is if you are in a lab meeting and um, you had a couple of different um, ways that you're talking about the different methods or controls that you want to do, you want to get all the ideas out there first. Then, depending on the factors that are important to you, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, maybe it's time, maybe it's cost, maybe it's the collaborators available, you're going to prioritize. And then you get specific, when are you going to do that? Who's going to do that? When am I going to know? Right. So then you're going to set the dates and the parameters around it. So the steps are, if you're feeling like overwhelmed, you're like, I got to do some strategic planning, remember these three steps. It's brainstorming, then prioritizing. All right. And, and then like getting specific, putting it on your calendar. So what I'm going to ask you to do next is, and some of you may have this on the ready, is the brainstorm part. List all the research activities or your other life activities in there too. Like if it's on the mind, you're like, I also got to get the oil changed, right? Like write in the activities that you have to do, say, in the next week. And I just wrote an example here. The brainstorming phase. And take a deep breath. Some of you, I don't want this to be like some sort of a, an activity that makes you stressed out, right? Like take a deep breath and find some comfort in the fact that we're going to organize this in the next 35 minutes. So write down a couple, take a deep breath, take a drink of that beer. I've just got water, but I'll get a beer later. How are we doing? Good, unless it's got confetti. All 
I'm going to ask in the next phase, in the next step, as we talk about prioritizing your, your steps, I'm gonna ask for volunteer. And so if you are willing and brave to be the volunteer, I think you'll get some like instant strategic planning coaching right now if you're if you're willing to to be that person so just be thinking if that's something you're willing to do i'm going to ask for a volunteer all right so you're writing down all the things does anybody need more time can you give me a thumbs up if you want more time let me pull up the chat if anybody's written anything in the chat too okay All right. Anybody need more time? We're good. Everyone's like, I got my list. Okay. I'm going to move on. Are we good if I move on? Thumbs up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Justin. Okay. <laughs> my like, N of two over 30 is, I'm like, but it's it's validation, so I'm gonna move on. It's not majority, but I'm gonna take you as like the representative voice. Okay, here we go. All right, so after you've brainstormed some, written it out, maybe it feels good to list things that you've been holding in your mind, you're gonna prioritize. So to prioritize, there's different ways to do it, but I'm going to introduce to you this thing called a two-factor matrix or a two by two. And you're like, you gotta be kidding me, T, that's an X, Y axis. Um, X, Y graph, right? We're going to talk about why this is a really, really good planning tool. And um, it's what you what you do is you define the factors that are important to you in completing your research, right? And then what you do is you define a zone for doing the activity itself. So I'm going to share my whiteboard again, and we're going to do this activity live. And let me see here. I'm going to find my screen. Okay, here we go. So this is where I'm going to ask for a volunteer. Would anybody be willing to share with me five activities from their list? Any takers? I'll tell you, when I did this for the, um, I forget which department it was now, maybe cancer bio, a faculty member offered and they were a faculty member and a postdoc were planning to submit to a grant. And so they were talking about their activities and they narrowed down the methodology they wanted to use. And afterwards, a faculty member was like, thank you for doing that. That really helped us. We were stuck with this thing. So right here, I'm telling you right now, we can figure out some stuff, we can make some decisions. Any volunteers? Olivia, ding, 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 ding. Thank you so much for volunteering. All right, shall we get to work? Would you be willing to share? It doesn't have to be your whole list. Give us four or five things that you are wanting to prioritize from your brainstorm list. Okay, so it's not as important as the, uh, the uh, grant there, but... <laughs> What I need to basically do in the next week, um, I need to read a paper for a meeting next week. Mm -hmm. I need to um, gather together some data from other papers, mm -hmm. protein sequences and crystal structures. Okay, you said it was, let's make those two different things, gather protein sequences mm -hmm. and what else? Crystal structures. Okay, so gather crystal structures. I okay. need to analyze some of my data. Okay. And I'm troubleshooting an assay. Okay, you're like, and that's just Monday. Okay. Okay, anything else you wanna add in there? Uh, that's it for now. <laughs> All right, 
Thank you so much. Now let's talk about defining the axes. Let's label them. What is important to you as you're making this decision? And there's no right answer, right? And the thing is about the two-factor matrix as you're defining the axes is that you can do them again and again. And the first one is just like your general um, feeling, right? We And when I was in, interviewing um, consultants about this, they were talking about how they'll sit in a team and they'll do a two-factor matrix and then they'll figure out the things they want to move forward and then they'll take those and do a two-factor matrix. So I'm not suggesting that, but let's just start with a general, that's an example of use. Let's start with like how, what's important to you as you're making this decision? Mm, time. Absolutely. Okay, so time. And? Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see what else. Uh, I guess just you know moving a project forward yes moving a project forward how much is it going to move you forward okay moving a project forward excellent okay so what we're going to do now is i'm going to ask you to tell me where to place a b c and d how much time is reading a paper going to take and how much forward how much more is it going to move you forward tell me to go where do you want it um well, this one is a pretty, I printed it off. It's a 25 page paper that I have to read. So it's going to take me a little more time yeah. <laughs> than normal. Okay. And um, it's, but it's kind of low on the project moving forward list. But. Okay. So like here, or do you sure. want me to move it? No, that's fine. <laughs> okay. And what about gathering protein sequences? Um, that will be higher on the moving project forward list and mm -hmm. probably equal, well, no, less, a little less time. Okay. So here, mm -hmm. and then what about gathering crystal structures? Mm, probably equivalent to B. Okay. So we'll put it right, um, here. Is that okay? Sure. All right. <laughs> Analyzing data. So time will be longer, but it'll be much higher on the moving project forward list. Okay. Do you want it here or do you want it up here? Where do you up want it? Here's good. Sure. Up here, mm -hmm. analyzing data. Okay. And then what about troubleshooting that assay? Yeah, E is probably pretty close to D. Okay. So put it over here. Sure. Up here. Okay. So now you've laid out some of your um, your tasks that you need to do in the next week. And thank you for sharing them. So what you want to do is define the zone of action, as I call it, or what, where are you wanting to, to be, right? So you're obviously wanting to be at a place where it doesn't take that much time, but you want it to be very impactful, right? Like the, you want to be kind of like here. Right? And I, I kind of drew that so that it, it hits some of them. So based on this alone, you would say, well, the thing that's going to make make me move my project forward and be the most efficient for my time is to do the gathering of protein sequences and the crystal structures. And I'm going to reevaluate reading the paper, or maybe I decide if it's something I really need to do, this is where the time management principles come into play. Just because it's outside of your zone doesn't mean that you're not going to do it, right? What you want to do, because you're just like, oh, I really do need to troubleshoot that assay because the, the next step depends on it really highly, right? So maybe your other um, your other factor here is um, how um, how much work can be or, or, or do other factors depend on it, right? Like maybe you have to email a collaborator to get an answer. It's kind of like shooting an assay. You need to troubleshoot the assay so you can do the assay, right? So maybe here the 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 the, the fact that it relies on another. Um, task is really high. We're here. You're like, this is just me. I'm just doing this myself. Again, this is reliant on me. This is reliant on me. And this is reliant on me, right? So you can define what that is. So another one of these, the circles could be, um, right, the amount of, um, if you were analyzing different experiments, you're like, maybe this is the cost of the thing, right? It's, it allows you for a third dimension. So one of the things that you can then do is, I'm going to take the circles away for now, is you can ask yourself, if, it, if you really know that you need to do that thing next week, is there anything that didn't make it into the square that you, that you really need to do next week? Uh, yeah. Which one? <laughs> um, really all of them, but all of them. I, I would say 
like D has to happen for sure because that's also for a meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so D um, has to happen. And A also has to happen for this meeting. Okay, A has to happen. Okay, sounds good. And the troubleshooting? I mean, it'd be nice if it happened by next week, but. <laughs> but it's okay not to. Okay. Yeah. Okay. At least we, hey, yo, we took something off. Okay. <laughs> Great. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the time management principles. So when it comes to time management, there are four ways that you can make your decisions. And you just talked about one of them, which is delaying it. You can delay E. So I'll write that here. I had chalkboard. I'm like, this is the only time ever that I've missed a chalkboard. <laughs> Let's see here. All right. So you can delay the action. Another thing that you can do is you can diminish the action, right? So diminishing would be, how do you get D to be less time that it's the same amount of time it would take to get into like whatever, however you've defined that, like hours, minutes, how could you diminish D, right? And then, and then what you would do is you could break that down into like, you know, D1, um, colors, D1, and this is like D2, and then you're like, ah, okay, now I can definitely get D, I can do D1. D2 still maybe not. Same thing with the paper, are there just parts of it that you can read? I mean, I wouldn't recommend, recommend reading, reading like odd pages, right, like you want to read, <laughs> but maybe there's like a section that's most useful, so then you can like break it down that way. So that's how you would diminish it so that it's doable. Another principle from um, time management is um, you can delegate it. Is there anybody to whom you can share the work? And this is really difficult for a lot of researchers because a lot of the work is reliant on you and you're moving it forward or decisions that you have to make. But the beauty in this technique or this particular tool of delegation it, is it helps you to think again about what's necessary and where the decisions are made, right? Um, and so that's one option as well. And then finally, if it's at all possible, you can delete it, right? And this is one of those things where um, I use a calendaring tool, a time management tool where I um, it's not a tool per se, it's a practice where I'll put every task, like for each one of these A, B, C, and D, I'll estimate how much time it takes. And then I'll put a calendar block on that, like on the calendar. And then the number one mistake, actually, let me ask people, I'm going to stop here for a second. So there, those are some options. So um, I'm going to ask people, what is the number one time management mistake that people make? You can guess. You can unmute or put it in the chat. Overestimating your time. Overestimating your time. Not planning. I, I would say actually it'd be underestimating uh, the amount of time something new will take. So if like uh, taking Olivia's example, like gathering sequences and uh, crystal structures, is if, um, you know, if, if it might take, in my mind that, on the outside, it might take only 15 minutes, but it takes me like half a day instead. Yeah, That's absolutely. Yeah, any other guesses? Prioritizing a task because it's been on the list so long, the not recognizing the priorities may have shifted. Absolutely. Maybe that thing needed to have been like deleted. If I move something on my calendar twice, it's kind of like bullet journaling. If I move it twice, I just am like, apparently that's not a priority to me. I'm going to revisit it whenever I strategic plan again. Um, absolutely. Any other? So we had the correct answer was um, shared. It's that you underestimate um, the time or you don't estimate correctly, as I guess Melissa was saying, like the amount of time wasn't allocated correctly. And so, um, you know, sometimes that has to do, you know, it, it, it's so it's very optimistic in a way. I think it comes from a good place. Um, not only do you want to be more efficient in the amount of time that you have, or maybe you've just only allotted that amount of time, but in terms of estimating that, it helps you again to realize, well, if I 
am going to uh, you know, do this task, I really only have two hours for the reading, maybe that's what you've allocated for yourself for the paper. And what is it that you're gonna be able to kind of you know, hone in? What is gonna be the thing that moves me along? And so thinking about that ahead of time before you sit with the paper, because it can be real intimidating and also exciting. You're like, I have this new paper to read. I love, you know, I wanna dissect all of the details. I wanna get all of the, you know, they did such amazing work. It's, it's all really exciting, but in the reality of it, again, strategic planning, thinking about why you're doing it, um, who you're doing it for and what decisions you're going to make from it, it will drive the way that you spend time with that task. And um, much like Casey mentioned, a lot of times just add an extra 20% on that time to, to fix, um, you know, to, to try to overestimate or, you know, give yourself a little bit more space. Um, my, my partner, who um, is a researcher also, sometimes would be like, I'm going to just run into the lab over the weekend and like do this assay. I'll, I'll be home in like two hours. And I'm like, okay, I'll see you in three. <laughs> like, we kind of know now. And, um, and so that's, um, you know, I think it's a, it's a part of the journey. And so one way that you can use this, not only in this broad strategic planning sense of like, what am I going to do for my um, my overarching plans for the next week, you can look at it from a day-to-day -day practice. So I was talking with a time management coach and she said, this is something she encourages with her clients that you look at your list or the things that you're doing the next day and try to start making those decisions. You know, like if you have set seven things that you need to do, which of the ones can you delay? Which ones can you diminish? Which ones can you delete and which ones can you delegate? And it just gets you into the practice of making decisions about it instead of looking at your day and going like, oh, my day's going to be crazy tomorrow. And it still probably is. Like I woke up this morning and I felt that way. <laughs> and that's normal. It's okay. But again, it's just like centering yourself on really what does need to be done to move me forward with my overall vision of what needs to happen for, for my projects in the next week, right? Or, you know, for your family or for your mental health, right? In terms of like adding exercise in there, for example. Okay, so what we're gonna talk about now is, um, thank you, Olivia, also for, for volunteering. Okay, so when, when is a good time to use this strategic planning to do, to do something like this? And so a great time is just when you're overwhelmed, right? If you're just like, I can't see, you know, two feet in front of me or everybody is needing something from me. It's just a good time to just sit and you may not even make any decisions from it. But if you find that you can, you know, jot them down and, and see, see it out in front of you, that might be a good time. If you're about to meet with collaborators, this is a great time to decide. Again, it's a great reminder of what, what it is that you want to accomplish with your research and the vision for your research. And then um, decide on what you're willing to be flexible about. If you anticipate like, oh, that the collaborator might want to, you know, suggest this, or we're going to do this, or they'll take that part and I'll take that part. You know, like as you're doing that planning, try to do it in anticipation of a meeting. It helps you to decide what you're going to be flexible in. Of course, again, it's not a rigid plan. It just helps you to understand what your priorities and your time commitments are and actually to see it out, right? So that's an example. And then as you're saying like, okay, well, I was really willing to do these things because I can afford to do them. I have the staff time to do them and it's important to my research. Maybe those were the three factors for your matrix. But the thing they suggested was outside of that square for me, then you're asking yourself, okay, how can we, but it's really, really important to them. And I've learned that it's really important to me. How do we get that into the box in terms of diminishing it? delegating it, right? Same thing, using those um, four Ds. So maybe you've presented to your boss, your chair, your PI, who, whoever you are, or your peers, and you just got all the suggestions, right? The research in progress or the works in progress is really great for that. You know, like everyone has something really wonderful to contribute, so many points of view on how you should do your experiments and ways to try things and how to proceed, right? You just get all the things and then you're like, oh my gosh, I don't, like, how do I decide which one, which path to move me forward next? That's another great time to do it two by two. And then the final thing I would advocate for is just to do it every six months. Check in with yourself and um, to, you know, to put it on your calendar, put a calendar reminder every six months to do some sort of a, a check in with your with your strategic planning. And then I think it's really important here with our lives being so busy 
and you're juggling so many things with research and family and health um, to be kind with yourself. And so when you do check in with yourself next week or in six months, and you see you didn't get to the things that you said you were going to get to, um, to say, you know, I did do things, some things as well, right? Celebrate the things that you were able to do. I think that's a part of the strategic planning, knowing that you were able to move yourself forward incrementally. So celebrate the things that you did accomplish and the things that you were able to, to achieve. And then look at the things that you didn't achieve and ask yourself, do I want to delete it? <laughs> do I want to delegate it, right? The four Ds. And I think the thing too is you often find that um, you can also apply what we call SMART goals to those. And so one way that you can diminish it, um, if you've heard of this term, is to make something a little bit more specific, a little bit um, to make it measurable. How do you know that it was actionable, um, that it, um, let's see here, realistic, and that it was time bound? And maybe some like something that you can add an accountability thing in there because it couldn't be really difficult if say like six months ago, you were like, start writing that paper. You're like, okay, that's a really, really good goal. It's a pretty bad strategy though, right? So if you were to make that smarter, writing the paper might be, you know, um, you know, sitting down and seeing if we have the data, do we have the, the publishable units and, and how much data do we have? That way it allows you you to see you know what's missing um you know you can make it i'm going to sit down with that postdoc or that grad student every week for the next and just kind of touch base right so now it's time bound and you have somebody accountable to work in and, and then you can work on your small goals as you go along but you can apply these to make it a little bit more specific measurable realistic and time bound to be helpful right i mean you could do the same thing about like i'm gonna clean my house this weekend great goal, not very strategic, where I'm like, okay, I'm going to vacuum two rooms by Saturday afternoon, and maybe I'm going to clean the sinks on Sunday. And, you know, my partner's going to do that. So then again, that's an example of making it more specific, because it's easier to tackle something if you know exactly what it is that you're going to do. That's a great one to delegate to. I'm like, hey, kids, you're going to help me clear out the, you know, the dishwasher. So again, um, it, it helps again to de define what it is. All right, so um, I wanted to um, kind of share this, this other thing, which is um, if this is what you're interested in, right? Like we started part of the work today. Why is your work important? Um, do I collaborate to get it done? If these, if these are questions I have, do I do it myself? Or do I collaborate with someone? What are my strengths and weaknesses when it comes to my research? What about the political environment, you know, social environment that I'm in? Um, what about collaborating specifically with industry or pharma? Can I set deadlines for others? Um, and how do I balance things? Um, how do I manage my resources? This is um, a part of the course that I put together that Melissa introduced at the beginning. It's called Business Concepts for Life Sciences. And so each one of those squares has a, like a business term to them. And we've created um, videos for you to watch and also a podcast because this was first developed with only videos. And then whenever I presented it at UT Southwestern, the researchers there were like, this is all really great, but I can't really watch the videos while I'm on the bench. Can you make me a podcast? So we wrote another grant and, and got the, the sourcing for it. And so you can find these on iBiology. Again, like it's all free. I make, you know, no money from it. This is all for you because I really believe in free access. And um, the videos we aimed to make 20 minutes about 20 minutes on one speed. And so, you know, you can make it as quick as you want as you listen to it. There's also a podcast strategy for scientists. We had a lot of fun making that. Um, and, um, and then the last thing I wanted to say is that what you've done today now is explored what was important to you. You've assessed the direction you wanna take and hopefully you're gonna write it out in a plan. What I was gonna do is give you a little bit of time to kind of calendar if you want and put it in there. And so if you wanna open up your calendar and start putting in some um, deadlines or reminders or milestones, or if you wanna keep working on your two-factor matrix, that's, that's really great. Um, the last thing while you are pulling up your calendar is I wanted to, let me see here. Is there a poll? I don't know if Melissa, if we mentioned this before. 
Uh, I think we have to do the poll before we get on Zoom. Okay. Can you just do um, a very simple yeah. poll that just is the answer is yes or no? I'm right here. Yes, I can do yeah. that. Okay. Don't worry about the question. I'll ask the question. I just have a yes or no. Okay. One second. Yes. No. Okay, what's the question? Um, the question is, have you done an IDP? Yeah, so the question is, have you done an IDP? And we'll say um, in the last, I don't know five years, <laughs> ever. <laughs> okay, you're filling it out now. Thank you. Thank you all for participating in this poll. Melissa and I were talking about metaphors before, like when I have my slide deck, you can see the slides that are coming up like it's ESPN. And it's like the same thing with the polls coming, like the poll results. I'm like, oh, it's like the scores. And then like the... Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you. We've had, we have about half people who have participated. So if you um, want to answer the poll, we'll leave it up for another 20 seconds. All right, two thirds, two thirds have voted. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. Here are the results. So to the question, have you done an IDP in the last five years ever? The answer, 15 out of the 20 people said no. Well, surprise, surprise, you can answer yes, because that's basically what we did today. We did an IDP. <laughs> I call it the sneaky IDP presentation. <laughs> Because that's basically what you do. You are assessing the skills you want to improve or the activities that you're wanting to do. Then you're writing a plan for them and then you're putting them down in a calendar or some, mm -hmm. something like that. And if you want to go into the IDP tool, you can put in your tasks and then set yourself a reminder for a calendar date, right? And then it'll email you and say like, hey, did you do that thing yet? Did you um, analyze your, your data or optimize your assay, for example, for Olivia. And so that's one way to do it, or you, you know, you could do it for yourself. And so the IDP, I know it has a really bad like rap. Um, I actually have worked for two of the IDP authors and they keep saying like, no, I think people misunderstand it. So I feel like I'm an IDP ambassador. Mm -hmm. um, you just did the process. Hopefully it wasn't a terrible, you know, it was a little bit enjoyable, um, not too stressful. And it's basically strategic planning. Um, so with that, I wanted to just end um, with a thank you and a chance to just answer some of your questions. Cause you know, we, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you have additional questions about the strategic planning process or moving forward, or if you want, please throw into the chat some of your best time management tips. I mean, like I said, we're all busy individuals here who have figured out to navigate this research world. And so if you have some tips, feel free to share it with the hive mind and throw it in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have a question. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'll start out. Um, so when you're doing your strategic planning, do you keep um, like your work separate from personal or are there times where you might have to merge that? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I think when you're looking at things like um, tasks that you get, need to get done, that makes a lot of sense to merge them because um, you just have a certain amount of hours in a day to mm -hmm. you know, take care of other things in your life. And so I've seen it done that way where people are doing that. I've seen it done also where you do it separately, where you're like, okay, do I really need to get the, the thing on the car fix this day? Or I do need to go in like, you know, blah, 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 whatever it is that you need to do. And then what you do, this principle is called time mapping. And what it, what you do is you set the times of day for personal things and for, and for um, work things. And so then that helps you to separate. And so you'll say like, okay, well, this is the personal time that I have. And then, and then, then you can prioritize within that. 
So the idea of time mapping is also really interesting. I saw a graduate student at WashU use it really well. And um, so for example, if you know that your most productive time of the day is in the morning, then you're going to want to reserve that for your own time. Like either it's, you know, you're going into the, you know, into the lab or you're working on your, your writing or your progress reports, whatever it is that you're doing. If that's your most productive time of the day, you map that out by saying like, okay, these hours are my working time. And then because email is often ways for, you know, you to communicate and for people to tell you what they need, you can do email after that. Right. And then you would just set an hour, like I'm just going to do an hour for emails or I'm going to do a half an hour for emails. And then you time map it again. Like I'm going to have meetings um, in on like Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, but no meetings on Thursday afternoon, protected time for more lab work. So this idea of setting time maps and chunks of time to, to protect for your priorities is, is a really good tool. So I had re referenced that, that grad student at WashU. So I was working with him on some um, application materials and he was saying, OK, I'll, I'll tell my um, I'm going to email my PI. She knows that I check email at one o'clock. And I was like, tell me more. And so he had worked it out with his PI that he is really productive in the morning. So he would go in and do his lab work and he is comp bios. And then he was also working on his data um, in the morning. And he and his PI checked in with each other on what they needed at one o'clock and at five o'clock. So there wasn't this like idea of emailing all day or slacking all day. And I, I know sometimes that's not like sometimes that's necessary, right? Like you have people who are working on new assays and you need that. But again, just have a block of time where you're like, hey, Thursday afternoons, I'm not going to be on Slack. And so again, that, that idea. And I was like, how having, that seems so foreign to me because when I was a grad student, I always wanted to be available to my PI. And this idea of saying like, you can catch me at one or five. <laughs> was like really odd. But mm -hmm. he said that he, he explained, again, you want to go from a place of like, shared ground, like this is going to make me the most productive so I can move forward on the things that we want to do. And so if that's okay with you, does it work for you if we, we like email at one and at five, or if that doesn't work for them, maybe she's, you got kid responsibilities at five and you're like, can you make it four so I can answer you before I leave at five, right? It's, a, it's about that communication. Mm -hmm. So not only do you make your time map, but you have to talk about it with the people who are your stakeholders, right? So when I was making my time map, for example, I said, I'm not going to do any meetings on like Friday afternoon or Friday mornings and on Tuesday mornings. And for my kid time, it's like after pickup and I would play with the kids. And then on Saturday, like I'm sending, I'm only sharing this not to share my personal life, but to say with you, okay, well, this is really great. And then we looked at my partners, right. And, and, um, and he, you know, we'd be like, okay, this is the time that I would like, what does it look like for you? And then we were able to map it and communicate with each other. And so it allows you to, again, prioritize and talk with your stakeholders on what that looks like. And so, and you can set, you can be like, okay, I'm making two dinners two nights a week, which, which dinners are you going to be? And again, it's not rigid. It's mm -hmm. just a way to communicate and make sure everyone's on the same page. But that's an example of a, of a time map. And, and how you, if you're interested afterwards too, I can share an example of my time map, Melissa. And then if you want to share, I'm going to send my slides to everybody too. So you can have my slides if you want them to. Great, thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions? All right, I have another one then. <laughs> Maybe people are too scared to ask. Because um, initially it seems like it's a lot of work to do all of the strategic planning, right? And the time mapping and stuff like that. So how much time did it take when you started and how much time does it take now that you've kind of done it for a while? Yeah, that's a really good question. Sometimes it depends on what I'm doing it. If I like just came back from a conference and I just want to download all the information, then I, I'll just do it to get a feeling for it. If you're trying to make a quick decision, it doesn't have to take too much time. I think it depends on um, how much processing you're needing to do and how big the decisions are. And like I, I also make this joke that, you know, if uh, you know we're talking about where we want to get dinner, right? We're just like, okay, we're going to map it on like, how, you know, how far is it do we have to drive? How kid friendly is the restaurant back when we could, right? Mm -hmm. And then we would map the restaurants and then I'd be like, oh, okay, well, obviously it needs to be in the square, but really I just kind of wanted to eat Thai food. Right? So sometimes you have a gut feeling on what you need to do, but then mm -hmm. it just reminds you of like, you know, so then that didn't take very much time. So yeah, it depends. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, and I, I guess I have one more um, time management tip to share, and this is from my postdoc advisor. He shared this idea of um, something called touch it once, which is whenever you open an email or you have a task, you do it right then. Because if you don't, then you're thinking about it and then you're coming mm -hmm. back to it. So really you've spent twice as much time on it. So if you're opening it, the same thing, like you get the mail in and, and you know you have a bill, if you're able to take care of that bill, then open it up and take care of it. But if not, put it aside because you only want to touch things once and that will make you more efficient too. Same thing with an email. If you're going to open it to read what they need, mm -hmm. are you going to be able to answer that? And if not, you know, or just like take the time to answer it. So you know, that's consider that just like let it marinate and see what that looks like or notice for you how often you do or don't do it. Because I noticed I got into the bad habit of like reading my emails at night and then figuring out what I wanted to do prioritize and then it would keep me up at night and in the morning I'm like stressed out and I'm like, okay, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna just touch it once so I'm gonna wake up in the morning and just handle the email then and then get through with my day and then answer email again at noon right. So those are just some other ways to approach the idea of um, taking care of something as you come along. Thank you. All right. Well, we have like two minutes before it turns five o'clock and everybody turns into a pumpkin. Uh, yeah. Does anybody have a last minute question? And this is my email if you would like. Yes. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to attend today. I hope that it helped you with some of your planning. And if you have any, like I said, any questions, please um, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we will be making this presentation available um, probably next week. <laughs> we have a YouTube page and I'll send it by email to the whole department. So thank you all. <laughs>